we are constantly bathed in a vast sea of external stimuli in the form of light, sound, odors, touch, and tastes. These stimuli are converted into nerve impulses which are carried by nerve fibers to the spinal cord and brain. Light and heat, sounds, odors, and touch stimuli would never be perceived by an individual and he would be isolated completely from his environment. Were it not for the sense receptors located in the head and in the body and limbs. In addition to external sense receptors, we have internal sense receptors as well. Thus in the stomach, we are aware of the sensations of hot and cold. In the intestines, we are aware of pressure and of pain. Our muscles have receptors responding to stretching and tension. Without these internal sense receptors, we would have no way of getting information about the state of our inner organs. Receptors for temperature, pain, touch, and pressure are found scattered all over in the body. Because of their wide distribution, they are known as the general sense receptors. Some are concentrated in the deeper skin layers. Others in the joints, muscles, and viscera. In a cross-section of the skin layers, Receptors for heat are found, along with receptors for cold. The presence of heat gives rise to a nerve impulse, as does the presence of cold. In a similar manner, Objects lightly touching the outer surface of the skin will set off nerve impulses in the touch receptor, as will the touching or bending of a hair. Bending the arm stimulates many pressure receptors located in the muscle tendon and in the capsule surrounding the bony joints. Thus, the brain continually receives data concerning the whereabouts of the body and limbs. We have been considering receptors for temperature, pain, pressure, and touch, receptors of a general nature. In addition to these, however, we also have a number of special sense receptors, all located in specific areas of the head. The first special sense receptor we shall consider is balance or equilibrium. In each side of the skull, there is a set of organs of balance located in the inner ear. Each set consists of three semicircular canals filled with fluid which form loops plus two sac-like swellings. At one end, each canal has a small swelling called the ampulla. Within it is a crest-shaped group of receptors hair cells embedded in a gelatinous substance. When we change horizontal speed or direction, the hairs are bent accordingly and originate impulses which are sent to the brain. The brain in turn sends messages to appropriate muscles causing compensating body posture. The sac-like portions of the pebble-like particles. When we move up, down or sideways, these particles stimulate the hair cell receptors. Nerve impulses, thus sent to the brain, keep it informed constantly of our position in space with respect to gravity. Both types of receptors function continuously, keeping us oriented as to our position and movement. Two other special sense receptors are the so-called chemical senses of smell and taste. Let us consider the sense of taste. Most receptors for taste are found in the mucous membranes covering the tongue, but others may be located on the palate, the pharynx, the tonsils, the floor of the mouth, and the underside of the tongue. 
On the surface of the tongue, receptors for the sensation we call sour are located along the sides. Those for bitter, across the back. Salty taste receptors are in the front and along the sides, while those for sweet are concentrated at the very tip of the tongue. Taste buds containing special receptor cells are located in the sides of little pits in the surface and sides of the tongue. Food placed on the tongue will diffuse in the saliva to coat the taste buds and soon reach a concentration causing the origin of a nerve impulse. In reality, many of the sensations we call taste are really due to the sense of smell. High in the nasal cavity on the underside of man's cranium or brain case is a very small patch of specialized epithelium, the olfactory or smell receptor area. Ordinary breathing does not bring much air into close contact with this area. But sniffing brings large amounts of outside air into intimate association with the smell receptor cell area. Smell receptor cells are connected to extensions of the brain coming down into the nasal cavity through tiny holes in the cranium. Molecules of odorous materials dissolve in the fluid covering the smell receptor cells thereby setting off nerve impulses which the brain interprets as sensations of odor or smell. A fourth special sense is dependent upon pressure changes in waves of air, the sense of hearing. Our hearing apparatus is divided into three parts. an outer ear chamber, a middle ear chamber, and an inner chamber. A hollow tube, the Eustachian canal, leads from the middle ear chamber to the upper part of the throat, the nasopharynx. The eardrum, a flexible membrane, separates the outer and middle ear chambers. Sound waves set the eardrum into vibration. The eardrum is attached to a chain of three tiny bones in the middle ear chamber, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. This is their size under high magnification compared with the head of an ordinary kitchen match. Mechanical vibrations of the eardrum are magnified some 30 times by the movements of these small bones in the middle ear chamber. The inner chamber of the ear is composed of the three semicircular canals whose function in maintaining body equilibrium we have already considered, and the coiled, bony, snail-like cochlea, which has two openings, the round window, and the oval window. The flat base of the stirrup is firmly attached in the oval window. When the stirrup pushes in on the oval window, the round window bulges out. When the oval window moves out, the round window goes in. If we could unroll the cochlea and see its insides, we would find three tapered tubes filled with fluid, two of which come together in a tiny common opening at the very tip. In a circular cross-sectional view of the intact cochlea, we see the middle tube contains a very complex structure. The organ of corti, which contains several rows of cup-shaped hair cells covered with a roof-like membrane. Vibrations of the stirrup transmitted through the fluid-filled cochlear canals cause corresponding vibrations in the organ of corti. These vibrations give rise to nerve impulses which are sent to the brain. Here they are interpreted as meaningful sounds or noise. 
vision, perhaps our most important special sense, is the one responding to light energy. Light which enters the eye is focused almost entirely by two transparent structures, the cornea and the lens. The rounded cornea lies in front of the iris. The convex lens lies behind the iris. Contrary to popular thought, the lens of the eye does not do all or even most of the focusing of light rays entering the eye. In reality, the cornea does two-thirds of the bending or focusing of light and the lens only one-third. The lens, however, automatically changes shape to maintain continuous sharpness of the light rays already focused by the cornea. As an object approaches the eye, its image goes out of focus on the back of the eye. By reflex action, a set of circular muscles surrounding the lens contracts, causing the elastic lens to bulge in the middle, shortening the focal length and bringing the image back into sharp focus. When an object moves away from the eye, the circular muscles will relax, the lens flattens out, its focal length increases, and again sharp focus is achieved. Accommodation is the term applied to the ability of the lens to change shape in order to maintain good sharp vision. The actual light receptors of the eye are found in the innermost layer, the retina, the blind spot exists where blood vessels and nerve fibers leave the eye. The fovea centralis is the area of sharpest and clearest vision. A cross-section of the retina reveals it is composed of ten layers of tissues. The actual layer of light receptor cells, the rods and cones, are next to the black pigmented layer. In order to cause the origin of a nerve impulse in the rod and cone layer, Light entering the eye must actually penetrate the layers of the retina. The impulse then travels back to the inner layer of the retina as it moves toward the blind spot and optic nerve. Moving toward the fovea centralis, we pass the blind spot which is insensitive to light. The fovea centralis, where the retinal layers are thinned and flattened out, is the area of sharpest and clearest vision. Although it is not yet known how we see color, it is known that the cone cells of the retina are involved in the perception of color. At night, when the moon is hidden and only starlight remains, the rod cells allow us to see shapes and forms in shades of gray. Thus, the human eye is a dual range instrument, perceiving objects in varying intensities of light, from the blazing sun to the dimmest gleam from the stars. We have seen that we are constantly exposed to various types of physical stimuli which are intercepted by certain receptors and in the form of nervous impulses reach the spinal cord and brain. Some of these receptors are located in the deepest layers of the skin. These and others may also be found in the skeletal joints, muscles and viscera. Each receptor is usually sensitive to just one type of stimulus. They include temperature, pain, touch, and pressure. They are called the general sense receptors. In addition, we have special sense receptors. These include balance, smell, taste, hearing, and vision. The semicircular canals are involved in balance. The crest-shaped hair cells in the ampulla respond to changes in speed or horizontal direction. And gravity changes are detected by the receptors in the saccule and utricle. 
receptors in a small patch of sensory epithelium high in the nasal cavity are responsible for the sense of smell. Taste buds themselves contain receptor cells sensitive to the various substances placed upon them. Sound waves traveling down the outer chamber of the ear impinge upon the eardrum. Three small bones in the middle chamber change these vibrations into mechanical movement and amplify them. Fluid in the cochlea is set into action by stirrup motion. The organ of corti responds to this fluid movement and sends nerve impulses indicating sounds or noises to the brain. The eye has a number of transparent fluids and solid structures. Two of these structures are very important in the focusing of light on the retina. They are the cornea and the lens. The lens does less bending of light than does the cornea. However, accommodation, a reflex involving the muscle surrounding the lenses, changes the shape of the lens and maintains sharp vision. The innermost lining of the eye, the retina, contains a layer of light receptors, the rods and cones. Light must actually pass through most of the retinal tissues to reach the rod and cone layer. The cone cells are involved with color vision and sight in relatively high light intensities. The rods come into use in very dim light intensities and enable us to see shape and form only. Together, the rods and cones provide us with a dual range light intensity receptor system.